All right. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Jayla Sanchez Warren. I'm the director of the Area Agency on Aging at the Denver Regional Council of Governments, also known as Dr. Cog. We call Area Agencies on Aging AAAs, so you're gonna hear me say that a lot. There are 16 in the state of Colorado, and Dr. Cog is the largest. We serve older adults in Adams, Arapaho, Broomfield, Denver, Douglas, Jefferson, Gilpin, and Clear Creek counties. Our job as Area Agencies on Aging are to help older adults and their caregivers. And we do this by funding a variety of services. So we contract with community organizations um, to provide services like transportation and nutrition services, legal services, chore services. We provide funding for things like hearing aids and eyeglasses and home modifications. We have 13 internal programs at Dr. Cog. Um, and we provide services like information and assistance, case management, the state health insurance program, which is all those questions about Medicare that you have, um, and the long-term care ombudsman program, which protects the um, people living in nursing homes and assisted living and also in the PACE program. We are the regional planning entity for aging in the region. And we try and understand needs, identify gaps in services, and then plan to better the lives of older adults in our region. And finally, we're federally mandated by the Older Americans Act to advocate on behalf of older adults. We do this at the individual level, at the community level, and systems regulatory level, and at the legislature. This is the first of four presentations we'll be providing and is the result of a summit we had with county councils and commissions on aging last fall. We wanna support all the councils, the work that the councils and the commissions are doing for older adults in our region. And we thought we'd start out with a demographic presentation. Then we'll talk about the results of, cons of a consumer assessment survey that we did um, this last winter. Um, we're gonna do a presentation on the, 24, the 2024 and 2027 area plan on aging. And then the fourth presentation will be on tools and techniques of advocacy. At the summit, we had the state demographer's office come and talk about the changes in our state's population the increase in the older population and what challenges and opportunities of an aging population are. And we thought we'd start here for the, we need to let everybody know about this trend. Um, the aging of our population is something that I think everyone needs to understand. It's the foundation of understanding and advocacy I've asked the staff from Dr. Cog's regional planning and development team to take a deeper dive into the changing demographics in the metropolitan area and, and help us understand why it's under, important to understand uh, the impact of an aging population. I would like to introduce Sheila Lynch, who is the regional planning and development director at Dr. Cog and Dylan McBride, who is a regional planner, who will be providing this presentation for us. Sheila, you wanna start? Great, thank you, Jayla. And um, Dylan is gonna kind of run the slides here. So he'll bring up some slides as well, but I'll just get started while he does that. Um, First, I just want to say it is a true pleasure to be here with you today. When Jayla asked us to be a part of it, we certainly jumped at the opportunity. Um, Dylan and I work um, in a part of Dr. Cog where we work with local communities to really think through what we need to think about for our future so that all residents can thrive. And so this seemed to align so well with the work we were doing. So we're really excited to share with you today. And I'm just going to pause before I get too far ahead of the slides because I can go off script and then that gets really messy really fast. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. 
Um, and Dylan, you can go to the next slide. So as Jayla was um, describing Dr. Cog, um, I was thinking about the many the many roles that Dr. Cog fulfills for our region. And the Area Agency on Aging is one really important role. Uh, we also, as an organization, have a role in transportation. And we often talk about our metropolitan planning organization role, or sometimes the jargon is the MPO. And um, this role is really about um, being an organization that brings together member governments to talk about transportation issues, both in terms of facilitating dialogue and policy discussions, but also a really functional role in administering um, funding for transportation and making sure that all the communities across our region have access to funding for transportation. And then a third role that um, we'll be leaning on more today is our role as a regional planning organization. And our regional planning role at Dr. Cog started in 1955. And one of our main purposes as a regional planning organization is to bring together our 58 member governments to develop a, a vision and plan for how we'd like to grow through um, as a region together. Um, we, this picture that you see on the slide is the front page of our current regional plan. We refer to it as Metro Vision. And if you haven't taken a look at it, please do, because it really illustrates, truly illustrates, we have these wonderful illustrations throughout that really start giving vision for how we want to grow as a region. Though I will say that it's uh, more than just illustrations. There's a lot that goes into developing a regional plan. And one of the key functions that um, our team at Dr. Cobb focuses on is developing um, growth uh, forecasts, really understanding from a data perspective, what does growth look like in the region? And we try to do that in many different ways to really just tell the story of what we anticipate in terms of growth for our region. And so today we'll share some data and information that hopefully starts telling the story of what it, what it will look like for um, aging in our region. Next slide. All right. So I know it's always always helpful to know the roadmap of how we're going to spend our time today. So we are going to kick it off with um, Dylan has prepared a ton of um, information about um, just around data and demographics, and we're going to walk through those. Um, that'll in include some look back, some historical perspectives so of how we've been growing as a region, and then some projections for where, where we anticipate the growth moving forward. Then we're going to take a pause about halfway through, and we'd love to hear from all of you. So if you have questions or comments or thoughts, Please, please keep track of those because we will we will take a moment um, and midway through to to discuss that. And then the second part of the presentation, we wanted to highlight a few key topics that we think might be relevant to you in your role as advisors at the local level to how do we really then take this data and apply it to our work at the local level to develop um, communities for healthy aging. Then we'll also have another time for questions after that. And then we'd like to end, end our time with you today, sharing some resources for how you might use this information moving forward. So I'm gonna pass it along to Dylan to get us started with walking through some of this data. Thank you, Sheila. And good morning, everybody. It's nice to be here with you. So I just figured I would start with doing a bit of a refresher or at least a, a ground truth in terms of where we're at now in terms of population. Um, so this data come, is coming from the State Demography Office. So as of 2021, our state population is here at 5.8 million. And so I wanted to find some ways to kind of compare that state population. So looking at state, uh, state population of those that are over 60, we're at about 1.6 million or about 28% of the state. Uh, so looking at our regional population, so within Dr. Cog, we're at about 3.3 million or roughly 57% of the state population. So just showing this is the representation of our region's population uh, comparison to the state. 
And then looking within our region, our 60 plus population is at 747,000 or about 22% of our regional population. So as Sheila mentioned, we'll look back and look forward periodically throughout this demographics piece. Um, so looking at population growth over the last 30 years, you see that this is some, this is the numerical growth. And then over here on this third column, you'll see that this is the past 30 years in our percentage growth. And so uh, I wanted to compare it to a, a couple of different locations. So we've got our regional population growth, the state, and then the nation. And what we're seeing also when we look at ahead and, and where we're projected to grow, you'll see that population growth is still expected to occur, but the population growth is decelerating a little bit. So you're seeing that the share of of population growth is definitely still growing, but it's slowing down a little bit. And one thing you'll also note is that with Colorado and the Denver region, in comparison to the nation as a whole, we are seeing, even though this population growth is decelerating, our growth is still outpacing the national trends. So some of the components that sort of inform the population growth are in general, we kind of break it down into natural increase and net migration. So natural increase looks at births over deaths. So uh, a natural increase would mean that there are more births than deaths in a year. And net migration is looking at of the folks that are both moving to and leaving the state of Colorado, net migration would mean that more folks moved to the state than left. And so here we're gonna break these things down. So in blue, we'll see net natural increase, so births over deaths, and net migration, so where we've seen the uh, a change in, in folks moving to the state of Colorado. So some key takeaways here. In the 1970s, we see some really large spikes of folks moving to the state of Colorado. And then again, in the 1990s through the early 2000s, we see these really large spikes. And as you'll note, since the mid-2000s through today, the net migration is still relatively high, but we don't see as many of those really large spikes that we saw in some of the other decades in the past. And another key takeaway here in terms of the natural increase of population is around this 2007 mark was our peak births, which means that this is when births were at their highest. And since then, it's slowing down quite a bit. So generally speaking, fewer people are having children. And that trend seems to be holding as we'll see uh, in some of the upcoming data. So just wanting to show in terms of in the state, where is this population change happening and trying to break it down by county. So of all age groups in the state, this is where population change is happening. So in case this uh, legend on this map is a little bit difficult to read, um, anywhere where it's blue is where you're seeing a, a net loss. So uh, population decreased and where it's darker blue, there's more decrease. And as we scale from yellow to red, you'll see that population grew in those counties and with darker red, meaning that there was more population growth. So one of the takeaways here is that generally speaking, population growth is being fairly concentrated within the front range. And so wanting to also compare that with the 60 plus population. So in general, what you're seeing is that the, the stronger concentration of population growth in the older adult category is also occurring in the front range. So also within the Dr. Cog boundaries. But another thing that's kind of in, interesting to compare against when you looked at where population change was happening by county around the state is that for the most part, you're seeing a lot less of the blue. So for the most part, most counties are seeing an increase in their over 60 population around the state. So in order to dive down a little bit deeper, we wanted to show what this looks like in the region. And uh, as was mentioned earlier by both Jayla and Sheila, we do have a little bit different boundaries when considering different programs within Dr. Cog. So this does follow our, our area agency on aging boundaries in terms of which counties are, are highlighted here. So what you're seeing is the share of the population 60 and older um, within the counties in our AAA boundaries. So where it's a darker shade of blue, more of this maybe turquoise-ish color, uh, you'll see that 
this is where um, there's a, a higher concentration of those over 60. And the lighter the shade of blue is where there's less um, uh, concentration of those over 60. So I'll just pause here for a moment so that folks can kind of take this in because there's a lot of data being displayed here. Um, and one thing I'll note is that this is sometimes where the display of data can get a little tricky because while we're seeing here in Gilpin and Clear Creek County, it's very highly representative of greater than uh, greater than 25% of the population is over 60. But I also want to just ground us really briefly in that Clear Creek and Gilpin counties do have a smaller population. So in general, they're, the numbers are smaller, but sometimes the percentage can make it look like they're representing quite a lot. And so here in this table, what we're looking at are county trends. And so uh, there's a lot of data here, but we'll walk through this. So I wanted to start with where our population is in 2021. So these are uh, the, the population of, of 60 plus within the counties in the AAA boundary. So this is what we're projected to see over the next 20 years to 2041. And this is our numeric change. So you're seeing a fair bit of growth in pretty much every county within the AAA boundaries with the exception of Clear Creek. And here again, we'll see that this is the percentage change of the growth uh, of the older population within these counties. And so just to kind of illustrate population growth by age cohort. So in the region, we've seen that over the last 30 years, those that are under 18, 18 to 64 and 65 plus, we've seen a pretty strong amount of growth in each of those different age cohorts over the last 30 years with the 65 plus category being the highest. And then over the next 30 years, what we're seeing is as that deceleration is happening and fewer births are happening, we're seeing the under 18 population is really kind of flatlining. It's a very, very small amount of growth that's occurring in that age cohort. In the 18 to 64 category, you know, there's less folks that are represented in those younger age cohorts. So as they're aging into the working population, there's just a smaller percentage share of growth in this age cohort. And the largest percentage share of growth is happening in the 65 plus category. So as we move forward and, and over these next 30 years, what we're really seeing is that as population growth is still happening, but the older adult population is really where the largest share of that population growth is occurring. And this is just sort of another way of illustrating the data. And so from 1990 to 2050, you'll see that we had a slight increase in the younger adult category, so those under 18, and then it's relatively flatlined. And for those that are 18 to 64, kind of the prime under retirement working category, we're seeing that there was some heavy growth, whoops, that occurred. Uh, and you're seeing some of that occurred right around these 1990s, 2000s, when we saw some of that net increase in migration that occurred in the state. And now this growth is still occurring, but it's starting to be a little less exponential. And the share of the population is really another interesting tech category that we're trying to look at here. So the green is showing that over 65, the share of the population is growing so that they're representing a much larger share than they used to. Another thing worth considering here is what does that look like in terms of households and household demand? So here we're seeing uh, household growth in households without children. And the a lot of the population growth moving forward will be uh, household demand of households without children. And a lot of that is being driven by a growth in households headed by those that are over 65 um, without children. So you'll see that that's a much larger share of the population that's that occurring there. And um, the uh, it's a nearly doubling. So it's almost a 98% growth. And so the category of folks that are under 65 and uh, having maybe fewer children, that's really only about a, uh, a one in five. And so it's not as much of a growth as really what we're seeing with the growing of households and uh, of older adults. So I just threw a lot of charts and tables at you. So I just wanna kind of pause and reflect in, in a, a different way. So some of the takeaways of what we've seen in the data 
is that Colorado has experienced a few large spikes of net migration in the 70s, again in the early 90s and 2000s. And over half of the statewide household growth by 2030 will be by Coloradans over 65. Most of these households are already here, so they're aging in place. Um, and we can expect continued fast growth among older adults um, with an age of 65 plus growing at seven times faster than those under 65. Uh, and most of the forecasted household growth will be among older adults and households without children. So um, I'll turn it back over to Sheila. We've got some discussion questions for you, but I actually, as I'm sharing my screen, I can't see the chat, so I don't know if there's anything that's come in, but I also want to give space for folks to ask questions of us. Great. Thank you, Dylan. That was a great overview. Um, you know, I just thought I'd walk us through this discussion time. So we have about 10, 15 minutes right now that we can entertain questions. Um, we have a lot of different ways for you to participate. If you want to type in your question in the chat, you can certainly do that. If you'd like to come off mute and we can hear your wonderful voice, you can do that as, as well. Um, so I'll just pause a moment and see if there are any questions from the group. If not, we have some questions for you to facilitate conversation. Wonderful. Okay. So I see a question in the chat. Do you know how many of the 65 plus own their own home? And Dylan, I can, can jump in or, or do you want to jump in and share that data point? If we have it. Yeah, sorry, yes. sorry, it takes a minute to go back to find mute as of all the different things. I'm actually gonna jump ahead briefly because we do have that kind of outlined in another part of the slides, but I'll jump there and then we can jump back if, that, if that's helpful. I'm sorry if I make anybody dizzy by going through the slides very quickly. So here we see that um, 67% of 65 plus households live in family households, 27% live alone and 4% live with non-family members. And so um, of these, the, uh, the thing to, to take away is that um, it's about, I think it's about 65% in, in the region, but I, I can double check that and get back with you uh, in the future. Great, thank you. And I'll just keep going with the questions. Um, we have another question. Do you know how many are living with a disability and then vision loss? Do you want me to jump in, Dylan, or do you want to jump in on this one? I don't have that information. So yeah. If you and I can just elaborate that we certainly could um, dive deeper into that. Um, we were today focusing more on regional growth and what that means for an aging population, but we can certainly look into that and bring that information back. And then another question, may we get a copy of the presentation? Absolutely. We will certainly share that and can get that out to everyone. I may pause here and just ask a question of all of you. So we're really curious to know, as you listen to, to all this information, how do these trends reflect what you're hearing and seeing in your own community? Any reflections on that? It's, it's interesting how, how many 65 plus are going to be aging or, or in the community. Um, and I guess just going back and sharing it with the city, um, I'm on the board and commissions for the senior resource, you know, senior commission, but I don't believe our city is prepared for that enough. Um, so, I mean, sharing this information and then we can go ahead and share it with our city council and, and more people so that way they understand that it affects our city in the Adams County area uh, quite a bit and our, our community. So this is great information. 
And, and that's so great, Tina. That's exactly what we wanted to do. And, and just so you know, this presentation is taped. So you could share this exact presentation with anyone that you wanted to. Wonderful. Thank you. And I think we hear that a lot from communities is that do we really understand what we what we anticipate to be the trends and how is that preparing us as communities? And I see a hand raised, um, Mayor Noon. I think you're still muted. There we go. Yep, I hit it, but it didn't go anywhere. Um, one of the things that that really hits home with cities, Tina, is that um, cities live and die by their sales tax. That's how we get our, our revenue. And if you think about seniors, seniors buy more services than they do stuff. And what do cities tax? We tax stuff, not services. So when, when you're presenting to your city and they sort of say, well, why should I necessarily care? They can care because as those seniors are aging, they're not going to be contributing to the um, revenue for the city, but they are going to start asking for more services. And where, you know, a lot of the counties have been um, the, the bigger providers of that, just due to the way our, our funding is set up, that is starting to change. And I think it's really changed for those of us that have senior commissions and, and councils in our cities because we wanted to have things more specific. So um, that's that's how I would relay it back. And, and because I have been on the AAA, even before I was mayor, I saw this coming. Jayla has been pounding this into my brain for so long that when I got to be mayor, starting a senior commission and starting to prepare for this growth is what we did. So it sounds like Commerce City is on their way and I'm glad you're involved. I, I typed a question but I typed it wrong. I'm asking, do you have this information by city? So for this, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Sheila. So for this presentation, we've broken things out by county, but we are in some some cases we are able to find uh, data by city. And one uh, area in which I can also point you to is that Dr. Cog has community profiles on our website which okay. is a way of providing a quick snapshot of demographic breakdowns by, and in that case, we do have by city and county. Great, thank you. Of course. Great, wonderful. And I'll highlight something from the chat that Karen shared. Um, it is interesting to see the growth in under 18 versus over 65, and then think about how so much policy is driven toward the 18 and under. And so that is, it is a really interesting perspective. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how that shifts. And as others are reflecting on, we hope it shifts fast, fast enough, right? Because it's coming right now. <laughs> and we need to start thinking about this now and not 10 years from now as we look back. I also see a reflection that we're um, from... Penn Street, uh, we are in, in great need of transportation options for our seniors that are reliable and affordable. Yes, definitely. I, as we think about this trend, what are those things we need to consider? Yes, and somebody pointed out, um, John Moran from Broomfield, that census.gov is a great resource. It provides data um, by the zip code and also at the city level. I see a hand raise, Christine. Thanks. Um, I'm curious what Dr. Cog is doing to, um, like, from a wraparound perspective. Like, I think Karen makes a really great point about policy, and you know, we talk a lot about this fiscal cliff that we're facing. Um, I know when I'm writing grant proposals, I'm often talking about the need because we see so we're we're seeing such a rapidly aging population, and we need more money to serve those folks. I'm I'm curious about how Dr. Cog is taking that like more holistic approach to say like, you know, we need better policy that um, is gonna support older adults, like maybe continuing in the workforce. I know there's a lot of work around um, the the um, graduation date bill um, that's running through the legislature right now um, and, and work around, you know, getting more funding. But I think there's a lot of, um, yeah. there's a lot of work to be done. Um, there is a lot of work to be done. You know, I've been, I've been, as Kathy said, 
talking about this my pretty much my whole career, yeah. the aging of the population, right? And the demographic change and it's coming and it's coming. Well, guess what? It's here now. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we are, uh, Rich Morrow, who's the head of our legislative um, uh, team as manager of legislation, um, he uh, has gotten an opportunity for us to talk to the JBC members about the fiscal cliff and about the needs and about um, funding service for people and communities. I think that's so important. Um, we are working on a lot of different uh, transportation wise. We talk a lot um, at, the, at the state level and federal level about the need for transportation. We've increased funding um, for transportation uh, starting in 2024, um, which is uh, using federal highway funds, which is really important. Um, uh, Sheila is actively involved in housing conversations uh, as are others at Dr. Cog and, and um, in the broader housing conversation talking about the need for affordable housing for older adults. So we're pushing it, not only the area agency on aging, but really trying to get this message out. Um, there will be a a presentation at the Dr. Cog board workshop um, on Wednesday, talking about these demographic changes, workforce issues, housing issues, um, and aging is a big part of that. Really trying to help people understand that this is happening and it's important um, and that we need to take action now and not wait 10, 10 years like Sheila said. I don't know if you wanna say anything else, Sheila. May I make a comment? Yes, um, please. I'm with uh, Thornton and I'm on the, uh, the active adult board for the city council as well as 55 plus club. And, and the, um, the board that reports to the council has broken up into subcommittees, one on transportation and one on affordable housing because we're finding those two things are big needs in Thornton. And we are in the process of gathering, <clears throat> excuse me, gathering as much information as we can. And this demographic um, presentation is, is gonna be very, very helpful um, to report to the, the city council on what we need in Thornton, uh, what we wanna concentrate on for seniors. So I just wanted to mention that I really appreciate all that Dr. Cog does and, and, and we're gonna be, you know, as everybody needs to look at the transportation and the housing area very closely. Thank you, Virginia. And that, that is a, a great segue into where we wanted to take the conversation next. Um, we, um, Dylan, maybe you can, awesome. We, we really wanted to think about how do we apply this to the context that you all are living in, in at the local level, making decisions around key topic areas. A great um, uh, data guru that I used to work with used to say, data is great. The data on its own won't change things. So thinking about how do we use this data to really inform big decisions, to plan programs is so, so critical. And so we wanted to spend a little bit of time today thinking through what does it look like at the local level? What are those key topic areas that you all are being asked to advise on? And how does this data start informing and shaping those conversations? So we thought, and I, I'm sure there's many, many conversations, but we picked three and some of them have been mentioned already. So I hope they're, they're in the ballpark. One is being as mobility and access. And the second one, housing. And then the third area is community living. And what we thought we'd do is maybe just touch on a little bit more data in those areas and then reflect on um, what are those decisions at the local level that are being made and how could information that's been presented here today enter into your conversations in Thornton or Commerce City around these different topics. 
So I'm going to pass it on to Dylan and he's going to dive into the mobility section. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's great to see that everybody's already kind of taking the first part of this presentation into and thinking about the, the various areas in which their community needs to be considering uh, the demographic transitions. So um, as Sheila mentioned, we've got a few topics here. And so mobility and access is kind of one way in which we're describing also just transportation. But um, as older adults, um, uh, we understand that they need uh, different transportation services sometimes and other members of the population. And as the share of older adults in the state and region grows, demands in our transportation system might look different than they do now. And we're also pretty aware that older adults often need transportation support and some capacities to make sure that they can uh, maintain access to the services uh, and amenities that, that they need in order to, to thrive. And so um, just looking at a little bit of data, from around the region. 58% um, of adults over 60 in the region report that transportation infrastructure is in favorable condition, just basically meaning that it's adequately serving the needs of, um, of them so that they can properly navigate their, their transportation infrastructure. And that, that's a bit of a catch-all, which includes roads, public transit, uh, bike lanes, sidewalks. Um, and so I think overall, could be better, but it also means that we're generally doing pretty okay in terms of regionally. Uh, nationally, we understand that 21% of adults over 65 do not drive, and regionally it's about 16% that are no longer able to drive. So as we're thinking about uh, designing our transportation system for multimodal transportation or providing a choice in terms of transportation um, mobility, making sure that we are recognizing that there's a share of the population uh, within the largest share of the population that's growing that is not able to drive or, or is not going to be able to drive. So thinking about how do we accommodate the needs of those users? Um, and so 38% of adults over 60 in the region report that they can easily access places that they need to go with transportation options outside of a personal vehicle. So basically this is saying that 38% of, uh, of adults 60 and over in the region are reporting that things like light rail or buses or other modes of transportation are, are serving their needs in terms of being able to get them to the places they need to go um, without them having to be able to rely on just using their car. And so uh, knowing that there are some transportation considerations that we'll probably need to be thinking about um, with our aging population, it's important to also kind of think back and say, okay, well, what kinds of transportation and mobility decisions are made at the local level? So as you're advocating uh, in your communities, it's it, you know thinking about what types of things your community has control over and what things that they uh, are, are just not necessarily privy to. And so um, some things that happen at the local level are pedestrian infrastructure, so sidewalks, crosswalks, um, comfortable crossings. Uh, so things like, can the sidewalk accommodate strollers, wheelchairs, and is it wide enough for folks to be able to walk comfortably and pass by each other? So, you know, are these uh, the sidewalks or the pedestrian infrastructure adequately serving the needs of folks? And do folks feel comfortable being able to navigate their community um, on foot? And bus stops and transit stations. So, you know, if we go back, if we go down on the slide, we see that at the regional and state level, most transit offerings like um, from the RTD Regional Transportation District or the Colorado Department of Transportation, we see that buses, light rails, these kinds of things tend to happen at a regional or state scale, but communities do have a lot of responsibility over bus stops and transit stations. So making sure that there's adequate lighting, that they're comfortable, that they're accessible, that folks can safely navigate to bus stops and can safely uh, use the bus stops. Maybe that there's benches or seating available uh, at these bus stops or transit stations. And in several cases uh, around the region, there may not be. And so thinking about what do we need in order to make sure that these stations and bus stops are comfortable for, for folks that may have some sort of mobility uh, limitations. Um, bicycle infrastructure is so making sure that bike lanes and bike trails are accessible, usable, comfortable, and safe for all users. Uh, and road maintenance. So, and this applies to roads that are under the county or city jurisdiction, so not state or highway roads, but making sure that they're free of potholes, that they're serving a level of demand on their transportation demands for buses and cars as they're driving over the roads, 
making sure that the, they're properly maintained to, to, to meet the needs of the population. And so I'll turn it back to Sheila for housing. Great. Well, we certainly um, in this region couldn't talk about how we're growing without talking about housing. Um, housing is a very comp complex topic. And so I just want to preface this by saying the comments today are not intended by being comprehensive and attempting to cover the entire topic. In, instead, what we hope to do today is just provide some information for you all that you might um, be able to bring these into conversations you're happening, having in your local community to talk about housing and housing affordability. So we thought it's it was helpful to think in terms of the historical context of housing and where we got to from a housing supply perspective in this region. So you all are very familiar with some of the our national historic context, but after World War II, we of course saw um, a rise in population growth, especially um, with households with children. And so as a response to that, what we saw across the nation was tremendous housing development focused on serving that population, which made incredible sense at that time in our history. And then as Dylan presented the information about um, the historical growth growth in the Denver region, it's, it's no surprise that we continued to build that housing stock because we continued to see growth in that area. We saw many, many households with children and so we we built to address that need. One of the things that we're now seeing is that as we look at our growth projections, our households are going to start looking a little bit different and that we are going to see more households um, without children, even 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 uh, households with um, with one one person. And so our need for housing starts shifting. But if you look at this um, pie chart that we have here, you'll really see that a lot of our supply in the Denver region, when we talk about housing units, most of it is in that single family de detached model, which may or may not serve, serve our growth in the future. I mean, it certainly will continue to serve, we'll continue to have that supply. But I think what I'm trying to say is that we may need some diversity in terms of the housing types that we need in our, in our communities. Next slide. So this is a slide that Del Dylan um, came to earlier to talk about households. So 65% of the 65 plus households live in family households, 27% live alone and 4% live with non-family members. We wanted to bring a concept into this conversation that I'm sure many of you have heard about, but it's often um, used in talking about housing affordability, and that's the concept of housing cost burden. And what that really means is that many, many years ago, our um, astute housing colleagues came up with this idea of talking about affordability in the sense of housing is affordable, typically, if someone is paying 30% or less of their income on housing. And the way they came up with that is they really just looked at what are the array of expenses that people have in their lives and what, what kind of percentage makes sense to allow people to still have funding and money to pay for the other expenses in our lives. I will point out that it's a very it, it gets even more complex as we talk about the 65 plus population because some people at 65 may not be earning the incomes they had in the past and they may be living off their savings. So certainly the housing cost burden model gets a little bit complex for that population, but it's still really helpful. And it's helpful, I think, at the local level because our housing experts will probably use this term as they're talking about um, housing. So 27% um, of homeowners 65 plus spend 30% or more of their income on housing. And as I pointed out, it gets a little bit more complex because this data point does not include savings that people are using. And 59% of renters 65 plus pay more than 30% of their income on rent. So when we think about that, that data and the context for our region, 
there are a number of different areas where decisions are being made at the local level that we may want to think about. What does this mean for housing in particular? What does it mean for housing for our 65 plus population? And so at the local level, there are a number of different um, what planners will refer to as local land use regulation decisions. So we used to back in the day call this our zoning code and now we call it our land, many communities call it our land use regulations. But thinking about how do we want to grow as a community and what are some different policy areas in order to accommodate um, diversity in our housing stock. And so certainly um, zoning and subdivision regulations, um, zoning is the piece of the land use regulations that talk about what we can do on a property and some dimensional requirements about what can get built, things like setbacks and um, uh, lot coverage and things that determine what the structure can look like on the lot. And then subdivision regulations are the piece that talk about how do we divide or split, um, divide up property? What do our actual land lots look like? And so there's a number of different discussions that can happen at the local level that can start ha shaping how we grow in terms of housing. One specific area of land development regulations are accessory dwelling units. I'm sure this, this group is well aware of this area of housing, but we also refer to these as granny flats or mother-in-law suites. And the concept here is just allowing an additional small unit on a property. And traditionally these came up to allow somebody, often a family member, to live on the property, but have some independence away from the main household or the main structure. There are certainly a lot of discussions too to be had around building regulations. And I know all of you have probably looked deep into universal design and making sure that our regulations at the local level allow for, for a lot of different creativity and accommodation um, for people as they age to um, be able to address mobility issues um, related to building codes. And then just wanted to keep on the radar that there are certainly state and regional conversations around housing. Um, certainly the state legislature this spring is talking quite a bit about housing. Um, Governor Polis has has said in his state of the state address that housing is one of his his number one priorities. So another thing to keep an eye on and to understand how that may impact your community. Um, Jayla mentioned that Dr. Cog is diving deeper into housing, that for some time, housing certainly is related to our conversations around transportation. We want to make sure that we're investing in transportation in locations, which make sense, which are places where people are living of course, but we are taking some, some um, more time and diving deeper into what are those areas that local governments are identifying to us, our member governments are saying, we can't tackle this piece of the housing challenge alone. We need some space and some opportunity to work regionally to come up with some regional solutions in order to address um, the housing affordability challenge in our communities. And I will pass it on to Dylan. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into community living. Thank you. So in community living, it's this is a very broad topic and can cover many different areas. But mostly what we're trying to understand is how are public spaces and places within a community uh, accommodating the needs of older adults. And so one statistic here is that 47% of adults over 60 in the region report that there are desirable public spaces in the community that they want to spend their time. So these might look like parks or recreation centers, libraries, uh, community gathering places, um, or even could be public plazas or main streets in your community that um, are ser maybe serving the need in some capacity for, for adults in, in your community. And so one thing that uh, local governments, this is an area where local governments have a lot of purview. Um, so parks and open spaces, so design of parks and open space and how they can meet the needs of various populations. Um, so, and that might include the addition of amenities for mobility limited populations like benches or accessible shelters. Could also mean that looking at the trails within a park might 
how do we make sure that they can uh, serve all users depending on how they might want to move throughout the space. And then public spaces and community gatherings. So again, your rec centers, libraries, your plazas, your stairways, crosswalks. And this also even includes things like snow clearing uh, and shoveling of sidewalks or public spaces and making sure that folks can be able to safely and comfortably access uh, parts of their community that they wanna be able to access. So this is just an area where as you're thinking about um, the needs of, of older adults in a community is thinking about what are public spaces and how can they make sure that we're designing them not just for folks that are maybe um, actively using a space um, in, in some one uh, phase of their life, but making sure that throughout the various phases of their lives, spaces can, can be comfortable for all users. And so with that, we've got another set of discussion questions, but I'm gonna pause here and also just say that this is another area where if folks have any questions about anything that we've covered thus far, please feel free to throw them in the chat or come off of, of your mic. And Jayla and Kelly, how are we doing with time? Do we have time to dive into some of these questions? Yeah, we do. Um, we're fine. I would say, you know, up to about 10 or so more minutes. Wonderful. Well, and then you have a resources piece too, don't you? Yes, we do have just, I think, two or three slides just to share resources. Okay. With all of you. So yeah, easily 10 minutes. Okay. Wonderful. If, oh, if nice people, to be ahead of schedule. It is nice. I was just going to say that um, if you don't have questions specifically about the information that we just presented, we would just love to hear how you see yourself advocating on these different issues at the local level and how you maybe envision using some of the information and data we've pre presented today. Well, one Again. of the things that we're doing in Thornton is um, we are we are thinking about, for instance, for me, I looked on RTD to see if I could get to the senior center if I couldn't drive. And I can't. And it's too far to walk. So, you know, this is the kind of information that we need to, to take to the city council. How many people can't get there using public transportation? And what other options do they have? Which is, I mean, we're just starting this, but we are investigating all the options that are available in Thornton, you know, and how easy are they to get? What do they cost? You know, all of those kinds of things to see how people can, you know, be mobile instead of if you don't drive. It's not healthy to just be in your house by yourself, or even if you have someone else. It's, I mean, you need to be able to get out. So, and the same thing with affordable housing. We know we have an issue with affordable housing. Um, there's, there's very little in Thornton. So, we are, you know, working on that too, and we'll take recommendations to the city council, and, and I'm. I was really happy to hear you say that we can't tackle affordable housing ourselves. We probably need help. Um, and we probably will be coming to you for help with that, uh, to, to, to really gather our information to present to the city council on affordable housing. Well, we're happy to help. And I do think it's really important for, for city councils and all of us to hear the voices of, of people that have um, different perspectives and can bring um, that advocacy for different populations. So yes, absolutely happy to help. Well, and one of the things that came up in, in our first meeting on transportation, we were looking at barriers that people might have to using transportation if they can't drive. And one of them is a lot of older people think transportation that's provided for them is charity. 
-hmm. And we don't know how to get around that. I mean, it's obviously an education process, but if they're not coming to the senior center, we're not quite sure how to educate them. Yeah, that's a good point, Virginia. It, 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 it is a challenge. Um, uh, Tina, you had some something that you would like to share? No, well, I was just thinking uh, in my experience, it seems like more people are having issues with um, housing taxes, living yeah. together. We have HOAs now. So how does that affect, you know? Yeah, property ADA taxes. Compliance. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, all of those things. Virginia, um, one of the things that uh, we will be doing in in Dr. Cog over the next year to year and a half is travel training, um, where we're really helping um, older adults understand what transportation options are out there and trying to get the message that you all paid your taxes and you continue to pay your taxes. And it's not charity, it's you already paid into this. It's kind of oh, like, okay. um, you. it's not, you've already done this. You right. pay your taxes, this is something that um, we can provide in your in the community, and we want you to be successful. Um, would you? And Tina, would you come? Sorry, <laughs> go ahead. Would you come to the Thornton Active Adult Center? Because I'm I'm thinking that if we educate people that don't need the transportation now but will in the future, then you know I mean we got to figure out how to to educate the ones that need it now. But we also need to educate folks before they need yeah. it that this is okay to take yeah. advantage of this. Erica, you want to and, jump in? Erica's going to lead this. Yeah, Erica's going to lead this effort at the AAA. So, Erica, you want to jump in? Yeah, definitely. We just started kind of brainstorming our our plan on how to outreach folks and where we want to outreach folks. And, you know, rec center was on the top of our list of places to start outreaching between the rec centers and the libraries themselves. Those are the places we were going to start going to to try to access older adults so we can just provide them with all that information. And one of the great things about travel training is that it's providing education. So even if they don't want to like access our direct services, it's providing the education so they can access it independently. So if they are in that mindset that they are saying, you know, I don't want to accept a handout or charity, we can walk them through, okay, but we need something different because perhaps it's not safe to drive anymore. So let's talk about how you can access other ways that if you have the financial means to pay for it, you can, but you don't necessarily know how to access it. And that's the great part about travel training is be able to provide either option so that if we can provide them with our service, we will. And if not, we'll just provide them the education on how to use a different mode of transportation outside of tra driving themselves. Right, and one of the things that's it's part of our goals with this transportation committee is to share whatever we learn with our active adults in, in Thornton. And, but, I, but I'm thinking that having someone like Dr. Cog also reiterate, you know, what, what we're saying would be really helpful because yeah. sometimes it takes more than one presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, you know, I know that that the commissions and the councils are working on a lot of interesting projects. I know some of you have advocated for parks and recs changes in your parks, at community parks, um, uh, advocating for exercise equipment for older adults in those parks, um, advocating uh, for bigger pathways so that you can feel comfortable walking and not feel like you're going to be mowed down by a bicycle. Um, I know that several of you have been advocating for um, walkable spaces, well-lit, um, safe spaces that you can walk. Um, and, and so I've just been so impressed with the things that you have been doing over the years. I've been around a very long time uh, at Dr. Cog, and uh, I, I just want to encourage you to keep on doing it and keep on advocating. And, and uh, like I said, we want to give you tools to help you be successful. And I hope this is, has been um, 
helpful to you and and the rest of the information that we give you over the next three trainings will it, it, it help you in your advocacy efforts and making right. those local changes. That, that's absolutely wonderful. I think this partnership with Dr. Cog and, and the local areas is just fantastic. Good. Well, and I see some other comments in the chat. Um, it sounds like Thornton Active Adult Board, you are all very busy and have gotten very organized with, with the advocacy in your community, which is fantastic. I also just wanted to highlight in Jefferson County, it was mentioned that when we had Aging Well, we did a lot of advocacy on senior housing options, for example, co-housing, in addition to ADUs, pocket neighborhoods, and more, which is also really fantastic. I might transition now because we are still here if you have other questions, but I know um, Dylan was going to share a little bit about some resources that might um, be helpful after the webinar um, if you need to dive deeper on this topic. So I'll pass along to Dylan. To... Yes, so just to make sure that you all have um, some of the access to some of the resources that we use to inform this presentation. Um, so a lot of the data that we sourced comes from the State Demography Office, and they have a great user-friendly website where you can access a fair amount of uh, the data sets, whether it's in table format or in a variety of visual models. So uh, if you want to look at some of their maps or their charts, um, things like that, you can fairly easily download as well. Um, so that if you need a quick reference uh, for something in your community, uh, they are a great resource uh, if you need some, some quick answers or uh, even more in-depth looks at trends, uh, whether that's past trends or future trends. So that's the State Demography Office. And in these slides, I've got hyperlinks here. So when we share these slides out, you should be able to link directly to these different uh, resources as well. Um, and then the U.S. Census Bureau, as I know somebody mentioned in the chat earlier, is great. And it's also kind of important to remember that there's uh, they, they collect data in a, a few different formats, but the one that we're all most familiar with is the decennial census, which happens every 10 years. And it's a really in-depth look uh, and it goes down fairly granularly into uh, neighborhood specific or track specific data. And then also the American Community Survey, which does estimates and those are done yearly. And the Denver Regional Data Catalog is a really great resource as well. Not necessarily so much specific to demographic data or um, aging data, um, but you can find a lot of other things like the built environment or transportation uh, boundaries, things like that. So if you need to compare some data that you're getting on the demographics from the State Demography Office, uh, within other capacities in your region. So, so maybe you're trying to do a bit of a study on um, what are some transportation resources in your community. The Denver Regional Data Catalog is a really great resource. And we source a lot of that data from our member jurisdictions. So we're getting um, real time updates as well. And Dylan, um, can I jump in to give an example? Oh, yes. um, when Virginia was talking about thinking about um, assessing accessibility to the senior center and what does that look like from a transit perspective or transportation options, but also sidewalks and accessibility in that way, that uh, regional data catalog has actual maps that show where sidewalks are in communities. So that's a very specific thing that you could you could draw upon and see um, in your analysis. And if you need any assistance with that, we have a wonderful team of uh, geographic information specialists who would be happy to help you out. Absolutely, thank you for that, Sheila. Um, and then, so as I also referenced earlier, we have the Dr. Cog Community Profiles, and that can be found on our main website. And so a use case for that is a you know community profile highlighting demographic or employment data, um, or for, in, for individual communities or for the Dr. Cog region as a whole. Um, so this can be like a, a really good source for the Census Bureau website is really useful in terms of the amount of data that they provide, but it can be a little... Uh, cumbersome to navigate. If you're not overly familiar with navigating the Census Bureau website, it can, it's not exactly user-friendly. 
Um, but the community profiles is our attempt to try and give quick highlights of relevant demographic data within communities in the Denver region um, in a way that is very user friendly. So that's also a really good resource. And then I threw this on here, which is the uh, AARP Livability Index. And this is an opportunity where you can dive into communities and neighborhoods um, where they do score uh, based on livability in different communities too. So if you want to try and understand maybe what uh, a different entity, uh, AARP, uh, might say about walkability um, or housing affordability in an area, that's also a really good place to get some, some quick resources. So, um, and then this one is an opportunity to plug a tool that the uh, regional planning team um, does uh, help administer with Dr. Cog. And this was a tool that was developed in partnership with the AAA and a variety of stakeholders uh, throughout the region, uh, both local jurisdictions, as well as um, nonprofit partners and advocacy partners. And so the Boomer Bond is a tool that allows communities to assess um, their current capacities around um, how they're planning for an aging population in their community. And so some of the, the topic areas that we pulled from in this presentation, namely mobility and access, transportation, uh, housing, uh, community living, these are things that the tool uh, dives into fairly specifically. So it's a way for communities in partnership with Dr. Cog to do an inventory of their existing uh, plans, strategies, infrastructure, et cetera, and kind of make sure that they're creating space for planning for uh, an aging population. So it's a really, as you're thinking about um, working with your local government officials, it might be worth mentioning, have they gone through this assessment? And if not, maybe just mentioning that this is a tool that Dr. Cog does provide that we're more than happy to walk through with local governments to try and make sure that they are thinking about a variety of ways to plan for an aging population. Um, anything to add to that, Sheila? No, I, I think you got that. That's a great thing to highlight. And I, I just might end with saying thank you to all of you. Um, I, I think our region is incredibly um, blessed with wonderful advocates. And I think it's really important, as Jayla was saying, that while sometimes it feels like we keep bringing up the same topics in, in conversations, it is so critical to keep those voices at the table as we're discussing the future of our communities. And hopefully the data we, sh we shared with you today and the information is helpful in your roles in your communities. And please feel free to reach out. Here's our contact information and we'd be happy to follow up and, and support you in your work. Thank you, Sheila. You and Dylan are incredibly precise because you ended like right on time. And, and so I want to encourage people to hang in here for another five minutes. We are going to go into our wrap up mode today. And I'd like to pass the baton to Kathy Noon at this point. Well, I just want to thank everyone for being with us today. I um, represent Arapahoe County on the um, AAAs and Aging Advisory uh, Committee, as do a number of the other folks that are here today, and where we have been doing all of this for years, and we get this kind of data shared with us at our committee meetings, we thought it was really important after our summit, um, and we saw the um, interest by our senior commissions and councils that really are advocating in their cities that we share this. So we're really pleased that so many of you joined us today, and, and the object of having these be a webinar is so that you can take this back to your your, your commission or your county council and be able to share the data with, with them or with an elected or whomever. So please use this as a, as a resource. We'll be sending out the link to it. It'll be on the Dr. Cog website. Um, and we really do um, really appreciate the interactiveness of this today. It's so much more um, um, beneficial to all of us if we're having a dialogue. And what you've told us goes into what we're saying, what we're doing as our Dr. Cog uh, AAA to be able to serve seniors. So specifics are great. So I'm going to tell you about some of the next steps. We talked about a little bit in the beginning, but just to reiterate, we are having a series of four of these. And so this was number one. Next month in March, we will get the COSOA results. And we love to throw acronyms out at Dr. Cog, but that's a community um, based survey that is not only mailed out to a sampling of seniors, but Jayla's team goes out and does personal interviews with groups of seniors, especially some of our more um, 
um, diverse and, and difficult to reach seniors. So whether it might be refugees or a very underserved population, they make an effort to go and, and specifically reach out to those groups to see what the needs are in their, in their, in their um, world. So that will be our CASOA result. Um, we on our committee haven't even seen it yet, so we're excited. We, we use this data to help us plan for the next webinar, which is our four-year plan. So we take those results and all the information that we get um, every year with our contractors and so forth, and we, we do a four-year plan. And that four-year plan, you know, guides us. And it's not always, you know, things like COVID tend to um, take that four-year plan and you know, we deviated maybe a little bit in a few in a few areas because you know we needed to feed people or we needed to get you know COVID vaccinations in. So just realize that we are also fluid in what we do at, at the AAA. So um, you'll be able to hear what the four year plan is to help with all of these issues. And then, as we said, the last one will be advocacy: how to help you be able to to communicate the needs of your community and the general Dr. Cog region in the state of Colorado um, in the future. So I. Hope Hope you will encourage others to join us at our future seminars. The e blast emails will go out um, as a reminder to everyone. And just know that once again, all of these will be available. And if you have questions and you need, you know, you, you watch this at, at a council meeting or a commission meeting and you have questions, our Dr. Cog staff is fabulous about getting back to people. And they will, um, they always send someone out to the um, county councils to our meetings. And as soon as we know more about our commissions, you might be surprised and we might pop up in one of those as well. You never know. Um, so once again, thanks so much for being with us. And, you know, if you found this helpful, um, do it again. And I think Donna Mullins, one of our other uh, members of the ACA is going to chime in. Donna. Yeah. Do we have dates for the next webinars? Kelly's shaking her head no at the moment. I don't think we have them confirmed. Okay. So that's on my very top of my to-do list. We'll be coming up with a date that works for March. Okay, great. Probably be at least mid-March or later, just to give us time. And expect an email from me, all of you, uh, with the link to the recording for this and also the wonderful PowerPoint that Sheila and Dylan took us through today. So once again, thank you so much for your feedback, for being with us today. And we hope you found this helpful. The, the comments in the chat are very encouraging because um, a small group of us after the summit um, thought this might be a good direction to go and you're affirming that this, this was an, a good next step. So we will continue to, to do what we need to do to make this beneficial for all. Jayla, do you have anything else you wanna to say to our group? Only thank you for attending and uh, share this information. Let everybody know so we can advocate for older adults in our region. Um, we've got the numbers, guys. We've got the power here and we need to use it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.